Assalamu alaikum students welcome back to class and in the American literature module we are currently doing Herman Melville's short story Bartleby the Scrivener now Bartleby the Scrivener um, is a story about a clerk or a scribe um, the in the previous lectures I told you the description of a scribe that Melville has given us um, now you have to remember that the time in which this story is placed is the middle of 19th century to be exact the story was written in 1853 and uh, Melville being a very prolific writer um, has given us something of the time in this story uh, he tells us the story of a lawyer who is also the narrator of um, the story and uh, this lawyer has in his office um, two clerks and um, an office boy you know the kind who runs around takes messages uh, brings papers or gives papers to people or perhaps will only go out to get something to eat or make coffee or something like that so the clerks um, are an integral part of a lawyer's office and a lot of the work that the lawyer does uh, is actually done by the clerks now we're talking about the 19th century we're talking about a, a period in time when we did not have um, the um, facility of technology like uh, photocopying machines or computers so a lot of the work had to be done by hand the responsibility of the clerks was great because um, these clerks had to copy legal documents and um, those of us who have um, seen a legal document um, know that um, there's a lot of technical language involved in a legal document and because um, you are dealing with uh, with the law and with the courts so everything has to be perfect any document that is to be copied has to be copied very carefully and not only does it have to be copied but it also has to be certified um, in the sense that once all the copies are made um, you sit down and you examine those copies now the easy way that um, they had was um, a system in which uh, one person would have the original and the others would have the copies so the person who had the original document would read out from that document and those who had copies would check to see if they had made any mistakes and um, uh, as the, the the reading was going on these documents were examined and any changes that needed to be made any revisions or erasures that needed to be done could be done at that time now the lawyer who is narrating this story um, says that um, there came a time when he was given a government assignment a government responsibility an additional charge as we call it here um, this additional charge was a master in chancery and because of this additional charge there was um, a little more work that was coming his way you know official documents um, that uh, were coming now when he got that additional assignment he advertised for another clerk and he got Bartleby now Bartleby when he came um, was a wonderful clerk in the sense that he would copy from morning to evening and um, he did not take any time off for uh, meal breaks he didn't go out anywhere he didn't receive any guests so in that sense um, he was a perfect clerk the kind of person who could be depended on the kind of person um, whom you would not have to look for so the narrator uh, assigns him a corner in his own office so that you know whenever he needs him he can call out to him so for the first few days this arrangement works perfectly until the time comes when he um, he that is the narrator wants Bartleby to do something and uh, Bartleby refuses 
but his refusal comes in such a polite manner that the lawyer doesn't know what to do. And Bartleby's um, words are, I'd prefer not to. Now, this use of the word prefer has a very strong impact on um, the listener because he's not de defying you outright. He's saying that he would prefer not to. Um, so you can't say he's rude, you can't say he's insulting, uh, and um, therefore you can't throw him out on that pretext. So the point at which um, we had left off in the previous lecture was um, the point where um, the lawyer becomes um, so angry with uh, Bartleby's non-cooperation that he decides to let Bartleby go. Now he, know, he realizes that Bartleby is poor, he doesn't have relatives, he doesn't have friends because nobody comes to see him, he doesn't go anywhere and he appears to be uh, making his home in the office. So um, having seen all that and having realized that he didn't have any place to go to, um, the lawyer thinks that he will make Bartleby a good offer. Now how he does that, we're going to find out in uh, what we do today. So he says, Bartleby, I owe you $12 on account. That is, that's the salary that he had uh, owed him. Here are 32, the odd 20 are yours. Will you take it? And I handed the bill towards him. But he made no motion. So um, when he offers him more money than he owes him, Bartleby does not make any motion to take that money. Now, if he had been an ordinary person, he would have grabbed those extra $20 and gone. But you have to remember that Bartleby didn't have any place to go to. Um, and um, this is something that his employer had realized when he came one Sunday and uh, he found the office locked. And when he um, knocked at the door, it was opened by Bartleby. So seeing him on a Sunday there, um, he examines the office and he finds out that Bartleby has been um, sleeping on a sofa uh, that is rather worn out, um, that he has been staying here the whole day and that is the reason why he's here from morning to evening. He's the first person there because he lives there. So by the time anyone else comes in, he's already dressed and um, he uh, is ready for work. So when um, his employer gives him an extra $20, Bartleby does not make any move to take those um, $32. So what does he do? He says, I will leave them here then, putting them under a weight on the table. Then taking my hat and cane and going to the door, I tranquilly turned and added, after you have removed your things from these offices, Bartleby, you will, of course, lock the door, since everyone is now gone for the day but you. And if you please slip your key underneath the mat so that I may have it in the morning. So the employer thinks that, you know, he's being very polite and um, he is managing things very, uh, very well. When he says, Bartleby, when you leave, please make sure that you lock the door of the office and put your key under the mat. Now, he has realized that um, the fourth key is with Bartleby because he has been making his home in the office and now that he is um, telling him to go, he still deals with him very politely. You cannot be rude to Bartleby because Bartleby is never rude. He does not adopt an insulting attitude. He's very polite very courteous but very firm in his opinion. 
So um, when his employer says, Bartleby, will you go? He says, I prefer not to. So at this point in time, when he puts that money under the paperweight, he tells Bartleby that he's leaving the money there and when he comes back, he wants to find Bartleby gone. I shall not see you again, so goodbye to you. If hereafter in your new place of abode I can be of any service to you, do not fail to advise me by letter. Goodbye Bartleby and fare you well. So very polite throughout it all because um, Bartleby has never been rude. You cannot say that he has an insulting attitude. Uh, it's just that up to a certain point he works and beyond that he says he'd prefer not to. He doesn't say I'm not going to do it. He says I prefer not to do it. So um, the lawyer is very uh, polite with him because Bartleby is always polite. So the lawyer says that um, I'm putting the money here and um, because everyone else uh, has gone, has left for the day. Remember this conversation is taking place in the evening when Bartleby and um, his employer, who is the narrator, are the only people left in the office. So when the employer is going, he says that um, when you leave, uh, I want you to put the key, the spare key, under um, the office mat. And if you feel at any time um, that you would like me to help you, send me a letter and I will do my best to help you out. So very polite throughout. Um, he refers to a letter because you have to remember that this is the 19th century. And the letter is um, the most uh, trusted form of uh, communication. But he answered not a word. So when um, the narrator says goodbye to him, Bartleby does not say anything. Like the last column of, a, of some ruined temple, he remained standing mute and solitary in the middle of the otherwise deserted room. So the room is deserted, everyone has gone home for the evening, Bartleby is the only one. And he remains standing, he does not uh, respond to um, his employer's words. He doesn't say goodbye. He doesn't say, I'm not going. But he just remains standing there. And Melville brings in a beautiful comparison um, with a building that is old and ruined. And the only thing that supports it is one pillar. So Bartleby is compared to that one pillar in an ancient and ruined building. As I walked home in a pensive mood, my vanity got the better of my pity. I could not but highly plume myself on my masterly in management in getting rid of Bartleby. Masterly I call it, and such it must appear to any dispassionate thinker. Bastardly, I call it, and such it must appear to any dispassionate thinker. The beauty of my procedure seemed to consist in its perfect quietness. There was no vulgar bullying, no bravado of any sort, no choleric hectoring and striding to and fro across the apartment, jerking out vehement commands for Bartleby to bundle himself off with beggarly traps. Nothing of the kind. Without loudly bidding Bartleby depart as an inferior genius might have done, I assume the ground that depart he must, and upon that assumption built all I had to say. The more I thought over my procedure, the more I was charmed with it. Nevertheless, next morning upon awakening, I had my doubts. I had somehow slept off the fumes of my vanity. One of the coolest and wisest hours a man has is just after he awakes in the morning. Okay, so let's go back a bit. So he says goodbye to Bartleby and um, he sets off on his way home. Now, he had been feeling pity towards Bartleby because it appeared that Bartleby had no place to go to. Um, and yet, 
when um, he is um, he, he thinks over it uh, on his way back he starts to feel that he has done something really wonderful um, as he says his vanity got the better of his pity so the pity that he had been feeling towards Bartleby that is replaced by um, a feeling of uh, of wonder at the work that he had done as he says it was masterly it no ordinary person could have done it um, because he had not showed any anger towards Bartleby um, there had no voices being raised there was no bullying as he calls it um, there were no uh, sort of challenges thrown out to one another it had all happened very very quietly and in a very decent and sophisticated uh, manner um, there had been no threats on Bartleby's um, side and there has definitely been no threats uh, issued by the lawyer that he would you know have Bartleby thrown out or uh, he would call the police or or anything else so very very quietly he had told Bartleby here is the money this is what I'm giving you extra and I want you to leave the office when I come in the morning I don't want you around so um, on his way back um, he sort of congratulates himself for having um, handled the situation in uh, in a wonderful manner without any shouting and screaming without any ranting and raving um, he assumed that Bartleby would do as he is commanded or as he is instructed and upon that assumption he built other things like offering him more money uh, like telling him to put the key under the mat and lock the door etc etc so the more he thinks over his procedure, the more he's charmed with it. You know, he starts congratulating himself and saying, oh, what a wonderful job I've done. Uh, but in the morning when he wakes up and just before he uh, becomes fully conscious, he starts having doubts. At night, he's very confident. But when he has had his sleep and the moment just before he wakes up, he starts to think, what if Bartleby doesn't go? Um, so th this occurs at a time when he's just about to wake up um, for his uh, for his uh, morning work um, to to start, and um, uh, the the narrator calls this point in time that is the time just before one becomes fully conscious as a wise as the wisest and coolest hour in man's judgment um, so when he wakes up he starts to um, feel doubtful about the way that he has uh, handled the whole thing my procedure seemed as sagacious as, as ever so he wasn't really concerned about his procedure he thought that you know he had handled everything perfectly but only in theory how it would prove in practice there was the rub so theoretically speaking what he had done was the maximum that he could have done he had given him extra money because he was um, terminating his employment without any um, any notice period so he gives him twenty dollars extra he had been very polite to him but very firm so the procedure he thinks was okay there's nothing wrong with the procedure how it proves to be in practice is something that could not be predicted you know you can have um, a theory but whether you can apply that theory properly or not is only um, seen once that experiment is complete once the, the the application of the theory has been accomplished so verbally theoretically it was a wonderful solution 
whether anything practical would come out of it, whether there would be any practical benefit or not, that he would only find out once he reached the office. So um, the great point was not whether I had assumed that he would, uh, he would quit me, but whether he would prefer so to do. He was, a, he was more a man of preferences than assumptions. So when he wakes up, um, the fear that overcomes him or overpowers his, um, his euphoria of um, the day before um, is that that was okay in theory. He had done everything. He'd followed the procedures. But would Bartleby actually leave the office? That is the question that overpowers everything else in his mind. So after breakfast, he walked downtown where his office was. And on the way, he was arguing the probabilities, the pros and cons. One moment I thought it would prove a miserable failure and Bartleby would be found all alive at my office as usual. The next moment it seemed certain that I should see his chair empty. And so I kept veering about. So he's, um, as he walks to his office, um, he's debating the question of whether Bartleby is going to be there or not. And um, he cannot come to any conclusion. So, um, you know, debating this point, he um, reaches, the, he reaches downtown where his offices are. And at the corner of Broadway and Canal Street, you know, so preoccupied is he, so obsessed is he with the thought of Bartleby that um, even when he reaches uh, close to his office um, and he hears people, um, you know, talking in an excited manner, he assumes that they are talking about Bartleby. And when he hears uh, a voice saying, I'll take odds, he doesn't. He takes it to refer to Bartleby and he says, doesn't go, done, put up your money. So there's somebody who's trying to make a bet on something totally different. And because the lawyer's mind is preoccupied with ideas and thoughts of Bartleby, so he thinks that the whole world is uh, talking about Bartleby and whether he's going to leave the office uh, quietly or not. So when he hears somebody saying something about somebody not doing anything, he assumes that it is about Bartleby. And just when he is um, going to put his uh, hand into his pocket and uh, take out the money that he wants to, um, to place a bet with, he realizes that it was election day. It was election day. And the people who had been talking about doing or not doing something uh, were referring to one of the election uh, contenders. Uh, and it had absolutely no reference to Bartleby. So, um, he, you know, th this shows you um, the, um, the strong influence that the thought of Bartleby has on his employer. He thinks that the whole world is talking about it, whereas that is not the case. So in this uh, frame of mind, very preoccupied, um, he uh, passes through Broadway and um, he, he feels thankful that he had not actually taken the money out and given it to somebody to place as uh, a bet in his uh, absent-mindedness. As I had intended, I was earlier than usual at my office door. So he leaves home early so that he can um, open the office and be there much before uh, nippers and turkey and ginger nut. Uh, he reaches his office and he stands still trying to hear, but he doesn't hear anything um, because all is silent. So he assumes, and there's a lot of um, assumptions 
and preferences that Melville is working with here. Assumptions on the part of um, the writer or the narrator or the lawyer and preferences on the part of Bartleby. So um, he had worked on the assumption that Bartleby would be gone and when he reaches his office and he inserts his key, um, he finds out that the door is locked. So when he finds the door locked, he starts feeling um, feeling um, sort of euphoric, feeling uh, happy that uh, what he had planned um, has worked well. And so uh, he bends down to get the key from uh, the mat where he had uh, asked Bartleby to put it. Now when he is sort of fumbling with the bat, uh, his knee knocks against a panel of the door and as soon as that happens, um, there's a sound from inside saying, not yet, I'm occupied. And it was Bartleby. So just when he had started to think that he had uh, won this battle against Bartleby, and Bartleby was gone, he finds out that Bartleby is still there. He is not gone, um, he's only occupied and the door is locked from the inside, not from the outside as he had thought. I was thunderstruck. For an instant I stood like the man who pipe in mouth was killed one cloudless afternoon long ago in Virginia by a summer lightning at his own warm open window he was killed and remained leaning out there upon the dreamy afternoon till someone touched him when he fell. So he's thunderstruck. He cannot move. He is so amazed that he just keep, he's, it's like, you know, he's turned into a pillar of salt. And he says, how could this have happened? He had assumed all along that when Bartleby was told that he was not required, Bartleby would go. Bartleby did not go. Then he assumed that if he were to give Bartleby the money that he owes him, Bartleby would go. He does not go. He's still there. So um, it, it totally amazes him and um, he doesn't know what to do. The only thing that comes into his mind is an incident that happened a long time ago in Virginia in which a man was leaning out of his house, um, out of his house window and he was struck by lightning and he died. He died on the spot, but nobody knew he was dead until somebody came up. They called out to him, got no response, and when they touched him, he fell. And that's when they realized that he had died when um, lightning struck him. So, <clears throat> so, so the employer, the lawyer, the narrator um, is shocked because Bartleby is still there. So when he realizes that Bartleby is still there, he, um, he doesn't know how to react. The first thought that comes to his mind is that Bartleby um, has won over him. You know, it's like a battle of wits in which he has, um, he, he has um, done everything and um, yet Bartleby is still there. He is not gone. He's not taken the money, etc., etc. So when he hears Bartleby saying, "Not yet. I am occupied," he um, he's, he's thunderstruck. He uh, waits there for a few minutes, and then he turns around, goes down the stairs, and walks around the block trying to digest this information that he has told a person categorically that he wants him gone. He's even given him the money. He's given him instructions on what to do when he goes out. 
and yet he finds out that he's still there so he he um, walks around uh, the, um, the the building block trying to make some sense out of what has happened turn the man out by an actual thrusting I could not and while he's walking around the block he has different ideas <coughs> he thinks of um, different ways in which he can tackle the situation um, turn the man out by an actual thrusting I could not so he couldn't physically uh, push him out of the office to drive him away by calling him hard ways would not do insulting him abusing him was not something that he wanted to do calling in the police was an unpleasant idea he didn't want to call in the police um, <clears throat> that was an extreme measure and he didn't see that Partleby had done anything um, in which the police um, should be called to intervene and yet what was the alternative that <clears throat> he should continue to defy um, his employer uh, he should continue to use those premises as his home uh, <clears throat> he didn't know what to do what was to be done or if nothing could be done was there anything further that I could do um, I could assume in the matter so he is totally confused he doesn't know what to do he doesn't know how to handle Bartleby so um, you know he, he goes on and on um, thinking about it and um, one of the ideas that comes to his mind is that he should um, sort of uh, walk into his office uh, in a hurry and crash into Bartleby uh, maybe that would give him the idea that he is not wanted but um, he says you know it, it, it wasn't a, a very good idea but he can think of no other way he doesn't want to call in the police he doesn't want to um, have him physically put out um, and yet the fact that Bartleby is in that office uh, gives Bartleby a sort of um, position of ascendancy it gives Bartleby the impression that Bartleby is beyond his control um, such a proceeding would in a singular degree have the appearance of a home thrust it was hardly possible that with Bartleby could withstand such an application of the doctrine of assumptions so um, still thinking of whether he should physically walk into the office and you know go bang into Bartleby um, he thinks that that's a good idea and yet when he starts thinking again um, it doesn't seem a very good idea to him so he decides that he will talk it over with him again okay so Bartleby said I entering the office with a quietly severe expression I am seriously displeased so he says um, he, he, he tries to adopt another uh, tactic and he says I'm pained Bartleby I had thought better of you I had imagined you of such a gentlemanly organization that in any delicate dilemma a slight hint would have um, sufficed in short an assumption but it appears I am deceived why you have not even touched that money yet and this he says pointing to where he had left the money yesterday so when he is um, going over and over um, these ideas in his mind um, he uh, decides to call out to Bartleby's um, deeper feelings deeper emotions so he goes to the office and he says you know Bartleby I'm very displeased with you I am hurt by your behavior I had thought that you are a very intelligent um, and well-bred gentleman and intelligent and well-bred gentlemen um, take hints very easily I thought that you would take the hint but you have not and when I have um, expressly told you that I do not require your services or that I want you to remove yourself from the the premises of my office uh, you have not done it and you are defying me and look you've not even taken the money I left for you um, yesterday evening Bartleby answered nothing 
Will you or will you not quit me? I now demanded in a sudden passion, advancing close to him. And Bartleby's answer, I would prefer not to quit you. And he emphasizes the not. So when um, the narrator, you know, puts that question to him in a sort of angry manner, um, Im he, he makes himself emotional and he says, will you or will you not quit me? And Bartleby gives a very calm and unhurried answer. He says, I would prefer not to quit you. What earthly right have you to stay here? Do you pay any rent? Do you pay my taxes? Or is this property yours? Bartleby answers nothing. Are you ready to go and write now? Are your eyes recovered? Could you copy a small paper for me this morning? Or help examine a few lines? Or step around to the post office? In a word, will you do anything at all? to give a coloring to your refusal to depart the premises. Bartleby's response, he silently retired into his hermitage. <coughs> so, uh, when his employer, when the narrator is very, very upset and he's very nervous, he just goes to Bartleby and he says, you know, what do you think you're doing? You don't pay me any rent. Um, this is not your property. Uh, I'm the one who pays rent here. I'm the one who pays uh, taxes on um, this office space. Um, you're not doing any work for me. How can you say that you have a claim to stay here and that you will not quit me? If you agree to working for me, if you agree to copying text or just to examine um, a small document or just to step outside to the, to the post office and see if there's any mail for me, you, if you do not agree to do any of these things, you do not have a right to stay here. And of course, to this, Bartleby does not give any response at all and just moves behind the screen where he um, is hidden from the eyes of the general public. I was now in such a state of nervous resentment that I thought it but prudent to check myself at present from further demonstrations. Bartleby and I were alone. Um, you know, he's, he's feeling very upset and um, and he's nervous, he's tense, and then the thought comes to him. Maybe this is not the right time to be saying all these things. Um, and then he gives reference to their position in the office. He says, Bartleby and I were alone. I remembered the tragedy of the unfortunate Adams and the still more unfortunate Colt in the solitary office of the latter. So um, he's reminded of an incident um, that had um, taken place earlier in which um, an employer um, was uh, physically assaulted by, uh, by his subordinate um, in 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 a place not very far away and um, not very long ago and just thinking of those two people sends a shiver down his spine because he realizes that it is getting dark and um, he is alone in the office with Bartleby so if Bartleby should sort of go mad and attack him there's no way that he's going to be able to withstand that effect. So um, just thinking of that incident um, sort of calms him down and he decides uh, not to do, um, to do anything about uh, Bartleby at this point in time. 
So he decides that, you know, this is um, not the kind of situation where he should uh, anger Bartleby and therefore precip precipitate some form of reaction from him and he decides not to say anything at present um, to Bartleby. Often it had occurred to me in my ponderings upon the subject that had that altercation taken place in the public street or at a private residence, it would not have terminated as it is. So he keeps on thinking of Adams and Colt um, and how that situation turned out to be. And he says, I have often thought that if Adams and Colt had been in, um, let's say, a house or on the street or, um, or you know, any, any other place but a secluded office, uh, maybe uh, Adams would not have uh, attacked Colt. It was the circumstance of being alone in a solitary office upstairs of a building entirely unhallowed by humanizing domestic associations, an uncarpeted office doubtless of a dusty, haggard sort of appearance. This it must have been which greatly helped to enhance the irritable desperation of the hapless Colt. So he's still thinking about the, um, the incident of Adams and Colt and he says that um, in his opinion if this uh, argument had taken place on, uh, on a public street or in someone's house um, it would have ended differently. It's just because that office was in a building um, which was unoccupied, um, a building which was high up, uh, not on the ground floor where um, people coming and going would, would hear what is happening. Um, and Adams and Colt were alone. So he, he says all these things sort of combined to uh, convince me that um, I should not really uh, antagonize Bartleby. Um, yet this it was that saved me. Aside from higher considerations, charity often operates as a vastly wise and prudent principle, a great safeguard to its possessor. So all of a sudden he starts feeling charitable because he knows that he can't afford to offend Bartleby he starts feeling very charitable and he says men have committed murder for jealousy's sake and anger's sake and hatred's sake and selfishness sake um, and spiritual pride's sake but no man that ever I heard of ever committed a diabolical murder for sweet charity's sake. So um, while he's uh, going over uh, all these uh, ideas he uh, starts thinking of the different murders that have been committed. And when he thinks of the different murders that have been committed, he realizes that there are murders committed uh, because of hatred, because of jealousy, because of anger and frustration and irritability. But he says, I have not heard of anyone committing a murder for charity's sake. So, um, I don't know how this um, position would have uh, been reversed or how um, this situation could have been um, dissolved. Because upon the occasion I question, I strove to drown my exasperated feelings towards the scrivener by benevolently construing his conduct. So, you know, he starts feeling charitable towards um, Bartleby and he starts to think of it um, from a very sympathetic uh, point of view. So when he starts feeling charitable towards him, he starts thinking, oh, poor fellow, you know, he doesn't have anyone in the world, he doesn't have any friends, he doesn't have any money, um, and um, he doesn't seem to have any relatives. So uh, he says, I also tried to occupy myself with other things so that I wouldn't have to, um, to confront uh, Bartleby and um, he starts thinking that um, you know um, during the morning uh, Bartleby might you know go out of the office leave and then not come back uh, but no half past 12 came 
Turkey began to glow in the face. Remember, Turkey becomes very irritable after 12 o'clock. Uh, overturn his inkstand and become generally obstreperous. Nippers abated down into quietude and courtesy. So um, Nippers and Turkey, they had their noon time transformation. And um, Ginger Nut munched his noon apple, but Bartleby remained standing at his window in one of his profoundest dead wall reveries. Remember what faces his window is a blank wall. There is uh, absolutely uh, nothing interesting outside his window. And yet, there he stands looking at the wall. What he looks at is beyond anyone's comprehension. Uh, and it's not something that people would believe, you know, that you stand in a room the whole day and all that you are looking at is a dead wall. Ought I to acknowledge it? That afternoon, I left the office without saying one further word to him. So he does not say anything to Bartleby. Um, he doesn't have any communication with him. Uh, and he leaves the office without saying anything to him. Some days passed in this way. Uh, and during this time, you know, um, the, the lawyer or the narrator was very uh, busy with some work that had come to him and he was um, reading up um, certain material which he says is Edwards on the will and Priestley on necessity and while he is reading um, these uh, lengthy works he starts to feel um, that perhaps whatever is happening is predestined. You know, he's, he's talking about fate and he's talking about chance. Um, and um, he starts to think that this situation has been fated, that he was fated to employ Bartleby, that Bartleby has a certain uh, position in uh, the, the, the lawyer's world. Uh, and there must be uh, there must be a reason uh, for Bartleby's being put into um, the scheme of things in the lawyer's office. So he starts thinking about um, these things, and um, he starts to sort of um, become more uh, tolerant towards uh, Bartleby's um, position in that office. And he says, yes, Bartleby, stay there behind your screen. I shall persecute you no more. You are harmless and noiseless as any of these old chairs. In short, I never feel so private as when I know you are here. At last, I see it. I feel it. I penetrate to the predestined purpose of my life. I am content. Others may have loftier parts to enact, but my mission in this world, Bartleby, is to fish, furnish you with office room for such period as you may see fit to remain. Okay, so when he's reading through these documents and um, he starts to come round to the idea that everything that happens in this world happens with a reason, Every person, every object um, that is created in this world is created with a reason. When he starts to um, think on those lines, he feels more tolerant towards Bartleby and he, um, he decides not to harm Bartleby in any way, not to, um, not to bother him in any way and not to let Bartleby bother him or irritate him in any way. Um, and, and so he sort of becomes reconciled to Bartleby's um, position or to Bartleby's presence in his office. Uh, and with the passage of time, Bartleby uh, becomes 
a part of the office furniture. It's something that is essential to the office and in, in doing that, uh, what, what Melville does is um, that he robs Bartleby of his persona and makes him into an inanimate object, like a chair, a table, which is necessary and yet has no life of its own, has no will of its own. So um, he starts to, um, to, to get reconciled to the idea of uh, Bartleby uh, as a part of his uh, office furniture and he decides that um, since Bartleby has a position in his office, um, his, um, his job or um, the, the reason why he has put into this world is to provide office room for Bartleby. So he starts thinking that there is a method in this madness um, in, in the office. Uh, I believe that this wise and blessed frame of mind would have continued with me had it not been for the unsolicited and uncharitable remarks obtruded upon me by my professional friends who visited the rooms. So he says, you know, if it had been only me, if it had been only nippers and turkey and ginger nut, I could have handled the situation. Um, I could have kept Bartleby as uh, he was, not given him any work, not communicated with him, but not stopped him from being there either, not tried to throw him out. The problem arose because um, I'm a lawyer. I have a government uh, um, duty to do. And this is not my home. This is my office where people from the legal fraternity drop in as and when they have work with me. So if it had been up to me, I would have maintained this arrangement. I would have kept Bartleby where he was. The problem arose because um, I'm not the only one there. Ginger nut uh, I could control, nippers and turkey I could control, but I could not control the tongues of people. Um, and he goes on to say that the constant friction of illiberal minds wears out at last the best resolves of the more generous. So he calls himself the more generous and he calls his friends um, as uh, illiberal minds. Um, so he says that if it had been up to him, he would not have bothered Bartleby at all. Uh, but he is a professional and as a professional people come to him, people seek advice, um, people come to him because they have work with him. Um, so he, he thinks that it's not strange that people uh, entering his office should be struck by the pe peculiar aspect of the unaccountable Bartleby um, and so be tempted through, to throw out some sinister observations concerning him. Um, so what happened was that um, although he didn't have any problem with Bartleby and he felt sort of comfortable having Bartleby um, in the office, the problem arose because there were all these people who were coming and going um, in to, to the office. Since he's a lawyer, he has uh, work with the, the courts of justice. He has... Um, work with the city government because he has additional charge as master in chancery. So the problem arose because he had people uh, coming to his uh, office and seeing Bartleby um, just standing there and they started to ask questions on, um, on, on who Bartleby is. Um, Sometimes an attorney having business with me and calling at my office and finding no one but the scrivener there would undertake to obtain some sort of precise information from him touching my whereabouts, but without heeding his idle talk, Bartleby would remain standing immovable in the middle of the room. 
So after contemplating him in that position for some time, the attorney would depart no wiser than he came. So like I said before, the tr trouble arises because um, it's not up to the lawyer only to um, keep Bartleby there. There are people coming into his office um, on, on work um, or just looking for him. Remember, this is the time before you had um, telephonic uh, communication. Um, so people would actually come to his office when they wanted some work with him. It, it's not like these days when you just call up somebody and uh, you talk to them and you don't have to physically go there. So when such people came to his office, um, when, he, when the lawyer was there, there was no problem. You know, they would just look at Bartleby, look at the lawyer, and uh, maybe just keep quiet, maybe ask a few questions. The problem arose when these people came to his office, um, the employer was not there, ginger nut nippers, etc., would have gone out, and they would see only Bartleby there. Now, when you go to an office um, and there's only one person there, it's obvious that that's the person you are going to question. That's the person you're going to ask, all right, where is Mr. So-and-so? And of course, Bartleby would give no information whatsoever. He would be absolutely silent. It's as if he's ignoring all their questions. He's ignoring their very presence. So these people would not be able to know where I was um, and would just uh, go away from the office without uh, getting their work done. Now we're going to stop here for today and um, hopefully we'll be able to complete this in the last lecture. Before I go off, let me quickly recap what we have done today in this um, story by Herman Melville. You know that the story was written in 1853 and that um, in this story uh, Melville is telling us about a scribe or a clerk um, who comes to his office and um, after a few days it seems as if he has sort of taken over the office in the sense that he starts to live in that place. Uh, not only does he start to live in the place, but um, after a certain uh, period of time, he refuses to do any of the work that the other clerks are doing. And he just stays there. He doesn't do any work. He doesn't go out anywhere. He doesn't have people coming to see him. Um, he doesn't seem to eat anything. Um, but he's just there. So um, it, it's a little upsetting for, um, for the lawyer who is uh, the narrator of the story. And he thinks of how he can do it. So what he does is he, he talks to Bartleby and he says, you know, um, would you like to leave me? And Bartleby says, I would prefer not to. Now, here's a man who is not doing any work, who is occupying space in the office, um, who doesn't go out, whom nobody comes to see him, who's not willing to give any information about him, his um, private life, um, and who doesn't seem to have a private life. So the, the lawyer gets very upset and he decides that Bartleby must go. So he um, calculates how much he owes uh, Bartleby in terms of his salary. And um, when he realizes that the amount comes to $12, uh, and he by this time has also realized that Bartleby is poor and does not have any friends or family to go to. So when, by the time he realizes this, um, he adds $20 to the money that he's giving him and he says, okay, here are $32. I want you to remove yourself from these premises. And um, when he has said that, um, he uh, adds that he uh, would like Bartleby to leave the office and um, to leave the key under the doormat. 
Now, when he's going back uh, home, he thinks about the situation again and again, and he realizes that, you know, he's handled it very nicely. He's not been rude. He's not um, uh, physically uh, harmed Bartleby in any way. He's just told him very quietly and very calmly um, that um, Bartleby should leave the office. So he sort of congratulates himself on having handled the situation very nicely. And this sense of euphoria um, lasts through the night. He goes home in the evening, he goes to sleep thinking that, you know, he's handled the situation very nicely. And just when he is going to wake up, the thought comes to him, what if he has not left? Now this is um, a sort of um, very rude awakening. And um, so he, he dresses up in a hurry, he has his breakfast and he goes towards um, he goes towards the center of the town uh, or downtown where he has his office. Um, and throughout it all, there's a debate going on in his mind. One part of his mind says, Bartleby will be gone because you've done it in such a wonderful way. Um, you've handled the situation so well that Bartleby will definitely be gone. And then uh, another part of his uh, brain says, you know, Bartleby will not have gone because he has no place else to go to. And so when you go there, you'll still find him there. Now, while he's debating this, he reaches um, the street where he has his office and he hears uh, somebody talking about um, somebody not, not doing it. And because he's preoccupied with his own thoughts, he thinks that everyone around him is also talking about Bartleby. And just when he's about to make a fool of himself, he realizes uh, that that is not the case. And so he goes up to his office and he sees that the door is locked. Now, according to the instructions that he had given Bartleby, Bartleby was supposed to put the key under the mat. So he bends down in order to get the key from under the mat. And when he bends down, his knee bumps against um, the, 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 the door panel. And immediately uh, there's uh, an exclamation from the other side. And he hears Bartleby saying, not yet, I'm occupied. So it's a little early and uh, Bartleby is not um, dressed or fully prepared for uh, for the day but he is still in the office he has not left the office so um, you know no way can uh, the narrator um, seem to get rid of Bartleby he tries everything um, when he refuses to um, to leave um, he, he's, he tries to call on the finer side of Bartleby's nature and he says, you know, um, you, have, you have hurt me. Um, I am upset because you are defying me. Um, why do you do this? And there's no answer from Bartleby. Um, when he's asked um, in an angry uh, mood, why he does that, he doesn't answer. Uh, when his employer asks him, would you like to go somewhere else? And he says, uh, I prefer not to. And when he is uh, told to leave um, his employer, he says, I would prefer not to quit you. Um, so with, with the passage of time, you know, the situation sort of, uh, stays the same. It's like stalemate. Um, and um, the lawyer starts to think that perhaps Bartleby does not have any other place to go to and therefore uh, he should not be, um, he shouldn't be arguing with him and he shouldn't be forcing him to leave when he has no other place to go to. So um, after some days, you know, he sort of reconciles himself to Bartleby's presence there and 
um, and thinks that maybe this is fated to be and maybe his uh, sole purpose in, um, in, in this life is to provide um, a space for Bartleby to live his life. Um, and he stays in this frame of mind for a number of days, but this situation cannot persist because um, he's not the only one who has to deal with Bartleby's uh, presence um, in the office. There are other people who come to his office, some who come for work, some are just um, searching for him. And um, when he says, when I'm here and people come to me for work, there's no problem. Um, but when I'm not here and Bartleby is the sole occupant of the office, people come to him, assume him to be a clerk, um, and um, will either say something to him or ask him about uh, the lawyer's whereabouts. And um, to all um, these questions, Bartleby does not say a single word. And um, this it is that, uh, according to the narrator, ultimately um, causes um, a sort of rift between Bartleby and uh, himself. But uh, we'll do this, um, we will do the details in another lecture. Um, thank you very much for listening very patiently. And uh, for today, Allah Hafiz. <laughs>